Hey everybody. Yes, Evan Diamond, your first question. It is starting right now. Hi everybody, it's Ben Davenport. Uh, I'm gonna to try to look at the screen and not at all the comments that are coming in. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, welcome to episode number two of the Producer's Perspective Live. Something we are figuring out as we go, or to use one of my favorite expressions, we are building the plane as we fly it. So um, thanks so much for joining us and letting us figure this out with you. Um, as I if you tuned in last night, uh, or frankly, if you didn't tune in last night, I did watch the replay, uh, and greetings to all of you who are not watching this live, but watching the replay, which will be posted tomorrow. Um, you know that, that, or you don't know that I'm doing this for a few reasons. Um, one, I'm a producer and I have to do something. I have to gather people in a room. That's what I think a producer does. Uh, and that's what I'm doing tonight, is gathering people in an electronic room because we can't gather any other way right now. Um, we're doing this for a few reasons. We're doing this um, to have something to do, frankly, to remind us that this is what it's all about. It's all about human connections. We may not be able to get out there right now thanks to this dreaded, dreaded virus. Um, but we can still do stuff like this. Uh, the reason the inspiration for this came from me checking in with some of my folks and seeing how they were doing. I'm going to sure all of you have been checking in with all your friends and loved ones. And if you haven't, please do. See how they're doing. Uh, and I got so many words of encouragement and great advice from all my friends that I was like, more people need to hear it. So that's what we're doing. Last night I kicked it off with just a few and for me, but tonight we're getting real and we've got uh, a Incredible guest is standing by literally what they call our backstage. It's our backstage with the team sports are just waiting for us. Um, but I wanted to talk about a few things before uh, we got there. And first and foremost, um, you know, this virus uh, is affecting the entire world uh, and it uh, really hit our own industry very, very hard and very personally today um, for so many of us as we unfortunately lost one of the greatest writers that theater has ever known, uh, and frankly, one of the greatest gentlemen that I have ever known. Um, please um, share with me just this moment uh, as we pay respect to Mr. Terrence McNally, who passed away uh, today, unfortunately, um, from complications due to the coronavirus. Um, my thoughts go out to his uh, husband, Tom, who is my producing partner uh, on It's Only a Play, uh, Mothers and Sons, uh, visit, uh, and what a lot of people don't know is my relationship with parents began way, way back. I was the associate company manager on the original company at Ragtime, and that's where I first met Terrence, and where I frankly fell in love with his work and fell in love with him as a person as well. Now, I'm going to write more about this on a blog tomorrow. We'll be posted podcast. He was one of my very first podcast guests. He was always came to everything. So once again, our thoughts go out to his entire family, to Tom, especially Tom, we're all thinking about you tonight. Uh, and this virus, I just, it makes me angry now. Um, but that's, again, why we are doing this, um, because this virus is affecting us all in many, many different ways. Uh, and we're going to take some time right now to check in with everybody and see how we're doing. And uh, I hear, I'm hearing some sound troubles. They're underwater. Uh oh, they're underwater. I wonder what that means. Let's, we're having some sound issues apparently. Thanks for letting me know. Um, we're going to try to correct these sound issues as we go. Let me know if uh, I'm telling you what we're going to do. Hold on a second. Hold on. We're going to try to do some things over here. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Give me some. Give me some updates. Someone, give me some updates on whether you can hear me. If whether it's a little better. Sounds like I'm underwater. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, Mary, Mary, our producer, are you listening? Uh, that's better. You got me now. Yes, I'm here. It's all good. <laughs> okay, good. Better. We got some better sound. All right, we are back. We are back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I. Uh, uh, well, you missed my tribute to Terrence McNally. That's what you've missed, uh, unfortunately. But um, I was just saying that I'm going to do a blog tomorrow about Terrence, who um, we lost today due to the coronavirus. Uh, and a big shout out to my, to my partner, his producing partner, Tom, 
uh, my producing partner, Tom, and his husband. Um, so we'll, I'll do a blog tomorrow. We'll recap that. Uh, I'm glad the sound was better now. I told you at the top of this, we are figuring out as we go. Uh, and sound is one of them. Sound, it's always a problem in the theater too, right? Someone's mic always goes. Well, our sound went tonight. Uh, but we're getting on with it. Uh, in just a few moments, we're going to have Stephen Schwartz join us. And a few things before we begin. Uh, number one, just remember why we're doing this. We're doing it to gather in a group. We're also doing it to remember this hashtag that we've begun. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. Please do your part to stay home. Um, that's the most important thing. You know, our governor here in New York has said uh, that we are just escalating here like crazy in the city, and we need to abide. We need to stay home. Lastly, we're um, drawing some attention to my one of my favorite charities, the Actors Fund. Um, if you can do anything, do something for the Actors Fund. Um, they're going to need it, and all the people in the industry are going to need it. Um, a, a question I got after uh, the podcast, or sorry, the live stream ended last night was, why are we doing this at 8? Well, of course, curtains go up at 8, right? But the other reason we're doing this at 8 o'clock is my daughter goes to bed at 7.30, and I'm in charge of bath time. And it's actually awesome. So I can't give up my bath time. Uh, so we're, we got to go at 8, and we got to have a little half hour. So half hour, 7.30, we go at 8 o'clock every single night. We have a great lineup coming up for you. Sierra Vargas, Alex Brightman, Alan Cumming, uh, Pam McKinnon. Just this week, look at this crew. Uh, Stephen Flair to the other Stephen from my Once in the Silent. Um, so great group. Join us every night, 8 o'clock. I promise we'll figure. Oh, next week, Mary wants to flash. Next week, look at next week. We're just going to keep doing this. We're going to keep doing this uh, until, frankly, you're sick of it. Uh, or until, frankly, even better that this thing is over and we can all get together and go see a damn show. But enough of me, what do you say? Let's bring in the man of the hour, the first guy to respond to my email to say, yes, I will do this. Please welcome Mr. Steven Schwartz. Steven, are you in the house? I, I am now, I was backstage, but I'm yes. in the house. It's um, working, hello Steven, how are you? I'm I'm okay actually. Um, I I do want to particularly because you were underwater. I guess for <laughs> for part of what you said, I I want to acknowledge the loss of Terrence McNally, who was obviously a great man of the theater, a uh, great playwright and book writer, also a good friend of mine. And as you did, Ken, um, send love to his husband Tom Curtehy, uh, also a friend of mine. Um, and like you, this made me really angry. Yeah. Uh, Terrence's Terrence's death made me really angry, particularly when I was hearing from. We're not going to make this political, but some of the things I heard some people say today, some of the idiotic things that I heard some people say today, Terrence is worth twenty of those people. Yeah, so, without a doubt. We, yeah, it really did seem losses. You know, we we can't have another loss like that. Yeah, it really did seem to hit us. Uh, hit the theater very personally today. All, you know, we've been hearing some some reports of some actors testing positive here and there, but um, they were not, uh, they were younger folks. They were people that seemed to be recovering. And then this uh, was just such a shock and a surprise. So our, our prayers go to him and his family. So you are doing okay though. You are well, you are I safe. Am. Where are you? Uh, I am in my uh, house in Connecticut. I am hunkered down. Uh, I guess you know I'm I'm I guess self quarantined. Although as far as I know, I don't need to be quarantined. Mm -hmm. But I basically haven't left the house for days, um, other than to take the dog out. Uh, but um, and it's very beautiful here. And what's strange, and I don't know if you're experiencing this, experiencing this, or um, other people listening are experiencing this. But friends I've been talking to have said this: that it's so busy. I don't quite know why, but the days you you know you're like okay, I'm just home. I'm not having meetings, etc. And the, and you're working away, and then it's six p.m. and you're like, wait, what? How did that happen? Where did the day go? It's just it's it's uh, and everybody's telling me how 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 the time is just going, which is strange. Yeah, I am seeing the same thing. It's this, and I don't know what if it is if it's our all of our this entrepreneur in us of like a desire to control something, so we're trying to keep balls in the air. You know, we all, I think, love what we do so much and we know the business and seems a bit threatened. Our world is threatened. So we're just doing everything we can to keep it going. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 really scary, you know, that for the all the shows in in America to be down, um, for the West End and London to be down. You know, I have a lot of companies of shows with yeah. um, actors and crew and musicians, and uh, you know that I care very much about, and all of them are, you know, just sitting around right now out of work. So we we just hope that. Uh, I mean, we obviously don't want to go back before it's safe, but um, but we look forward to when we can go back. And I just hope you know all the shows can come back. That's that's the scary thing. Yeah. You know, will will it affect some shows that so they under not deservedly don't don't get to come back? I, I really really hope that doesn't happen. And you just opened a show. Tell us about how Prince of Egypt was going over in London. Yeah, I mean, we were we were going great guns for three weeks. Um, you know, selling really well and um, getting standing ovations every night. I mean, I know that sounds, you know, you're, as I'm hearing myself say this, it feels like, you know, self-promotion and I, I don't mean to be doing that. But, but the truth was it, was, it was going very well. I think the show is absolutely beautiful to look at it. You know, my son Scott directed it and Ken, you've worked with Scott and yeah. was in absolutely top form. Um, the good news about that is while we are on hiatus um waiting for the west end to open again um the cast album is going to come out any moment so any moment great was it accelerated because of this did you no actually and it, it was delayed um we we very fortunately and providently um recorded the cast album um in the in the during dry tech while the actors were free and the musicians were free while they were, you know, figuring out how to make the set move up and down, et cetera. Um, we, we recorded the album then, and then over the next couple of weeks, mixed it and mastered it. And, you know, we're sort of ready to go with it. And of course, then the show closed down and we thought, well, what should we do? But then, uh, so we, so we've been holding it for a bit, but then um, Kurt Deutsch, whose record company Ghostlight is going to, um, bring out the record, uh, pointed out that um, Passover is coming up. And, you know, it's Prince of Egypt is the Passover story. So we thought like for Passover and, and Easter, which follows hard upon its heels, uh, we would, as a, as a little, you know, sort of gift and hopefully a pick me up for people, um, we would at least digitally release the album. So um, I think it's safe for me to announce that. And, and if not, Kurt Deutsch will be mad at me. No, he, not now. No one gets mad for anything now for this kind of stuff. Release as we go. Um, that one of the stars of a television show just announced when his show was going to be coming back, and literally Netflix tweeted at him like, "What? What are you doing?" What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. It's just all uh, you could say just about anything. It's so funny you talk about Passover. For those of you who don't know, uh, the first show I lead produced was, of course, Stephen's Godspell. Uh, and we we made a fantastic album of that uh, that I listened to. Yeah, yeah. and um, someone from the record company at one point, uh, like the second year of it, emailed me in about a March April period, and they literally said, "Ken, Godspell's album sales just shot up like crazy. Did you do anything? Did you?" I was like, "It's Easter. It's Godspell," because it, it, the productions I'm sure surged at that point too. I guess, yeah. I, I hadn't thought about that. For they do, they yeah. do. All right, every year, a little peak, a little peak. All right. So well, you mentioned keeping yourself busy. Are you are you working on anything new right now? Are you? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm uh, collaborating with my um, frequent collaborator and very good friend Alan Mankin. We're um, writing some songs for a potential movie, and I'm being mysterious because. The movie is just, um, it's not greenlit. We don't <laughs> know if that's going to happen. Um, but part of sort of trying to see if the studio is going to go ahead and actually, um, you know, give, give a green light to this movie um, is that we have to write a couple of songs. So we are, um, you know, doing that every day. And but basically, even though Alan lives 10 minutes from me, we're basically doing it over FaceTime and, uh, you know, um, sending things back and forth, posting things to Dropbox and, you know, not not having direct physical contact, but uh, but making progress. So normally you, your process would be in a room with Alan. Would you be Absolutely. sitting in a room? Yeah, yeah. That's how you normally work. Can you 
talk talk about your normal process and then talk about what it's like in this different one if it's difficult easy how you're getting through it yeah well i mean my normal process when i'm is mostly writing by myself and so that hasn't changed at all <laughs> but um for collaborating um you know with alan because he lives 10 minutes from me i would basically jump in the car and you know drive over the hill to his studio and and be there as we were working out um you know music and and um you know i would be suggesting lyrics and he'd be trying things and we we like to do a lot of stuff in the room together um but that's not happening and that kind of thing is you know you, at least for us it seems awkward to just hang there on facetime or zoom or whatever so um so we haven't been doing that we've mostly been um posting things to each other on Dropbox and then talking about it on the phone. And uh, if it really gets dire, I'll, I'll go over there and stand six feet away from the studio. <laughs> uh -oh. Sing to him through the window. Or that hasn't been uh, necessary. And we've been FaceTiming with the um, screenwriter and the director. Um, you know, it's all, it's what everybody does these days. So. Do you think but, this will affect how people collaborate in the future? Do you think? I mean, when I think back on it, I realized that, um, you know, on Wicked, Winnie lived in, lives in Los Angeles, Winnie Holtzman, the book writer. And so a lot of our collaboration was via emails and long phone calls, et cetera, because we didn't have fancy things like FaceTime and Skype then. Maybe we had Skype, but we didn't. But anyway, um, and then um, on Prince of Egypt, uh, Philip Lezebnik, who's the book writer for that, actually lives in Denmark. So again, there was, you know, a lot of um, Skyping going on. Um, so I think it's just the, the way of the world now. Um, and and consequently, when this virus has come along and, and we're still working away and collaborating, it isn't all that much different than, uh, than it has been for the last few years. I'm going to turn to uh, some of our, you're welcome to throw in uh, questions into the comments and, and I'll ask a few. I got one right now from Jack Ferreira. Jack, um, do let us know where you are, by the way, uh, in the in the comments. Let us know where you're coming in from. But Jack asks, and this is a great um, question to ask for this moment in time. It's that famous writer's block question. Uh, how do you overcome writer's block? Um, and what do you do if you feel your work is similar to another, I guess, of your own or someone else's? Um, but more specific, tell me about writer's block and when you're facing new challenges right now. I, I have a glib and ready answer um, to talk about writer's block because one time many years ago, I was experiencing that. Um, it was actually when I was working on the movie of Hunchback of Notre Dame, and I was almost like that cliche that you see in the movies of like the right that I wasn't on a typewriter and then balling up paper and throwing it on the floor. But it was like that. It felt like that. And um, after a couple of days of this, I, I, I was feeling extremely whiny. And I was talking to a good friend of mine, a writer named John Bacchino. And I was telling him about this and how I, you know, I was experiencing, 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 easy for me to say, this block. And what John said was, oh, well, you're being the editor too soon, which is such a brilliant comment. Because if you think about it, when as writers, we're actually constantly switching hats. So sometimes we're the writer and we're just, you know, gushing things out there. Hopefully we're putting something out there. And then we're the editor who's judging that and saying, well, this is good. That's terrible. And here's a little nugget I can use, but I have to get rid of all this. You're judging it and, and making choices. If the editor shows up too soon, if your internal editor shows up too soon, then you can't do anything. So the way to get around writer's block is to allow yourself to just do terrible work. Um, I have another good friend, screenwriter, um, Dean Pitchford, and lyricist of Footloose, who, um, who, when he writes a screenplay, he labels his first draft of the screenplay, shitty first draft, <laughs> to give himself permission to just write bad stuff, just to get something awesome. down. Um, in terms of if you look at something and you feel, uh oh, this sounds too much like something else, it's too similar to something someone else has written or something I've written, they, the point is you have something there 
and therefore you can make changes in it. Mm -hmm. um, but but I have been known to call someone, you know, call friends up and say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to play you this tune. You have to tell me if I stole it. You know, <laughs> bye bye Blackbird, because I, I I feel like I've heard this before, but I don't know where. And almost always they say like, no, no, I think it's just you. I love it. I love that writer's block answer too. One of the best answers I heard, the blogger Seth Godin once wrote, you have to imagine yourself like anyone else, like a plumber. A plumber doesn't get plumber's block. They just, they just plumb. They just keep going. You just have to keep going through it and forget about it. Well, you, have to, you have to be willing to just put stuff down there that you know is not good um, because that will then lead you if, if you're lucky and, and you keep at it, that'll lead you to stuff that, that feels better. But you can't just stop yourself if, if, if the first, uh, you know, if the first water coming out of that, you know, spigot that you're, you know, pumping up and down, if that first water is sludgy and brackish, you know, you can't worry about it. You just have to keep going. Do you have an example of something that you cut from a show that was not good? Do you, do you have an example of something you're like, God, yes. So yeah. many examples. examples. Um, well, we were talking about Alan Menken. Okay, so the very first song that Alan and I wrote together was um, Colors of the Wind for Pocahontas. And, um, you know, we sent the song in, lyrics and music to Disney, and they were very enthusiastic about it. And we were going to get set to record it and you know all the big orchestra was coming in and Judy Kuhn was coming in to sing and you know it was going to be a very expensive session and um and then people were going to start drawing things which was very even more expensive and like three days before we we're supposed to go into the studio Alan calls me and he was you know shyer with me at that time because this was our very first song together and he said look i i just have to tell you i know everyone likes this song i just don't like the last three lines of the song and i know we're i know it's late but i i finally have worked up the courage to tell you that so here's what the original last i'm it's embarrassing because they're not very good but here is the, the last three lines of the original three lines of Colors of the Wind, which is Pocahontas singing to John Smith. Uh, and they were, um, for your life's an empty hull, till you get it through your skull, you can paint with all the colors of the wind. And Alan said, first of all, I don't think the word skull belongs in this song. <laughs> Secondly, Hull feels really, really forced. And, I, you know, of course, I whined for a while and complained and said, well, it's such a difficult triple rhyme and colors is such a hard word to rhyme and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, but then, because I believe in collaboration, look, your collaborator has to be happy yeah. and it's like marriage and, you know, you both want to be happy with everything if it's possible. So um, so I went back and, and right, right before we recorded the song, I abandoned the triple rhyme, trying to find a rhyme for colors and did, um, you can own the earth and still all you'll own is earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind. So much better. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, but there's an example of just like a terrible piece of writing that <laughs> Yeah, that got cut. But I have whole songs of which, well, you know, uh, but yeah, yes. The that end. is an inspiration for all of you out there. If Steven Schwartz can admit to that and do that, uh, so can you. Um, you know, uh, Evan Diamond asked a question here that I think is uh, is a really good one. You're obviously very successful at this point, multiple musicals produced all over the world, but it's not always easy. I mean, people, we tend to look at folks like you and say, wow, it just... There he is. He's just this big musical theater superstar, but it's still hard and it's been hard along the way. What's one of the, Evan asks, can you talk about overcoming adversity and perhaps share a personal story when you were uh, down hard and how you found the motivation to keep going in this very yeah. difficult business? Um, it's a really difficult business and it's a really mean business. Whoops, I forgot that I'm in a room with the phone. Uh, Hopefully somebody will pick that up. It's great. I watched a CNN 
interview with someone whose FaceTime was going, it's all fine. No one gives okay, a shit. Okay. Yeah. I'm assuming that, that, that someone's going to pick this up. It's late for people to call, but um, uh, it's actually my son calling. It's but I'm hoping. Well, you can tell him Megan saying, "How dare you tell that right. story yeah. about the How dare you tell that story? Come on, pick up the phone. There. Okay. Um, yes, adversity. So, um, yeah. With, with uh, I mean, yes. I, I I feel like we all have lots and lots of adversity, and um, because it's a very difficult business and it's a mean business, um, and. We all have our failures. I certainly have many of mine. You know, I'm I'm not a critic, darling. Um, my shows and me, both of us, tend to get slammed most of the time by the critics. And um, even when the shows are successful, ultimately, you know, even even when audiences like them, you know, that still hurts. Um, and then when you can both get slammed by the critics and the show is not successful, that can that can really, um, you know really be devastating because you've spent so much energy and worked so hard on it. Um, yeah. And there've been a couple of times where I just thought like, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore. And I've stopped mm -hmm. for a while. Um, really? But the, yeah. Yeah. Um, after the, um, the original production of working um, in 1978, um, I know everybody thinks of working as, you know, this hit now because it's had this wonderful life, but the original production um, didn't succeed. And, um, yeah, and that was after a lot of kind of tough blows for me. So I basically stopped for, for quite a while and just thought like, well, you know, I'm going to do something else. And and again, in the early 90s, um, when Children of Eden, again, a show that's gone on to a very happy life now, but um, originally failed in London, um, you know, again, I thought like, well, I, I went back to school actually for a while to become um, a psychologist. And uh, I was... No, yes, in, in the early 90s, I was, um, I was at NYU um, studying psychology, and then I got this call from Disney saying <laughs> that they were looking for um, a lyricist to work with Alan Menken, and that sort of ended my career as a therapist, as a psychotherapist. But I still hope in some alternate universe that I'm, I'm having that career, because I, I, I would have liked to have been a psychologist too, if you could somehow do both. Well, listen, you've said some amazing things to me over the course of our friendship and working together. And I know you inspire a lot of writers with all the work that you do. Um, let's take another question. Troy DeFore from Toronto. What are your thoughts on working on multiple musical projects at one time? And what are your thoughts on working on book lyrics and music all by yourself? Uh, do you uh, juggle multiples or are you a one show at a time guy? No, no, no. I, I usually working on a couple of projects at one time first of all you you know in our business you, you have to throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall because you really don't know what's going to stick um and so i think first of all out of self-defense i've learned to work on several projects mm -hmm. at the same time well not several but two or three um i also find that it sort of is refreshing to leave one and go to another for a while, um, and they sort of cross-pollinate in odd ways. Um, yeah, so um, I would, I, in terms of doing more than uh, one particular role on a given show, I would never write um, the book to, um, to one of my shows, other than I, I did adapt working, um, but that was that was mostly editing, not writing. But I'm I'm just a terrible book writer, um, so uh, I I would never presume to do that. Um, and uh, and it's and but but yeah, doing just music and lyrics is enough for me. <laughs> what do you have uh, any tips for for folks who are trapped at home right now that want to create, that want to write, that want to do something on how to do it in the midst of all this and not getting down and as every story over CNN seems to pummel us to the ground? Yeah, well, actually, as I said, everybody I'm talking to is all of a sudden very busy. It's like, the I think the first week or maybe two weeks, we were just freaked out and yeah. everybody was just like, what am I gonna do? And how do I rearrange my life? And I'm just trapped here. And then suddenly 
It sort of started at the end of last, but I really thought happened today. Suddenly everybody is, you know, I always meant to try and write this, or I have an idea for something that I'm going to sketch out, or, um, you know, even to like, uh, I've always meant to clean out that cupboard, or I, everybody has projects now. Um, and I And I think, you know, we can look at this in two ways. We can look at it as being trapped at a fearful time in our homes, and to some extent that's true, but we can also look at it as an opportunity that we've been given a gift of time mm -hmm. we might not ordinarily have, you know, and, and so much of, uh, you know, we spend so much of our time, I think, complaining about, oh, where did the day go, and uh, the day got away from me, and I, I wasn't able to do this, and I wasn't able to do that. Well, now you have some time where you could do some of that stuff, and if you've always meant to write something, or you have an idea, or a song you've been thinking about, or you want to, you know, develop your voice by doing you know, practicing, et cetera, um, or practice the violin or whatever you want to do. There's a lot of, you now have time to do some creative stuff. So we should, what will happen is when this is over, obviously we'll be really glad about it, assuming that we still have a, an economy, et cetera. But assuming <laughs> we can make it back, um, we'll be glad about that. But I'll bet part of us suddenly misses, oh, I, I kind of missed having all that time when I was <laughs> exactly. It's incredible advice. And I want to thank you so much for sharing uh, this time, uh, your time, your cabin time with us and all the people joining us uh, here tonight. Thank you so much for being uh, a friend of mine uh, yeah. and um, for joining us on this first night. Okay. I look forward to the next. You. They, you have great people coming up. I'm going to look forward to hearing what they have to say. We do. We do. All right, everybody, wave goodbye to Stephen Schwartz. Thanks for listening, guys. Watching. All right, everybody, that's the uh, just wrapping up the end of our second episode. I hope you enjoyed uh, Mr. Schwartz. He's a fantastic guy, and I, I didn't know he was going to be a psychologist. Uh, if you've ever got a chance to work with him or know him, um, you or you can ever do. He does a lot of incredible uh, things with writers. He has kept be a project, a lot of stuff. And he actually, that therapist thing comes in very, very handy when he's working with writers. He's fantastic at it. A um, couple things before we go. Don't uh, forget, we will be here tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we have Sierra Bogus. Is that right, Mary? Yes, 8 p.m. tomorrow night with Sierra Bogus. I uh, hope you're enjoying this, by the way. Please send us comments, feedback, all that stuff. Sierra is an incredible, incredible talent and just an incredible person filled with light, love, and positivity. Uh, she's got this cool thing called Light Lesson. She'll talk about that, but I guarantee you, and she will sing for us. I know it. Uh, she'll do a lot of stuff. She's going to brighten your day. She's an incredible spirit. Uh, don't forget, please stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. Whatever you do, please keep inside and maintain that social distance. Uh, so we can get through this and all get back to a show very, very soon. Uh, and lastly, don't forget about the Actors Fund. Uh, the Actors Fund is the great place where you can give a little something if you can right now. I know everyone's hurting a little bit. This is affecting everyone everywhere. Uh, some people, though, a little bit more. If you have a little extra, go to the Actors Fund. Uh, and that's it. Did you have fun? Did you enjoy? I hope so. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. There'll be a replay of this on Facebook. Share it, please. Incredible word from Stephen Schwartz that I know will pick up lots of people around the world. So just spread the love. That's all we ask, and we'll keep doing it. We'll see you tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. Thanks so much, guys.